the Samuel Johnson Prize, is essentially dedicated to the idea that truth isn't just stranger than fiction, it's better than it. It's in its 16th year now, the prize, and since it was first handed out in 1999, the first prize winner was Anthony Beaver with Stalingrad, it's established itself as the, really the preeminent prize for non-fiction books. We're very lucky to have almost a full house for you today. Uh, we are missing one person. Uh, Greg Grandin, whose book, The Empire of Necessity, is about a, a slave rebellion off the Chile coast. He can't be here tonight. He's flying in tomorrow for the award ceremony. But we have everybody else. And they are, in order, uh, John Campbell, who's here to talk about his biography of Roy Jenkins, uh, A Well-Rounded Life. Next to him, uh, Alison Light. She's here to talk about um, her book, Common People, which is an account of family history and, and much more. Caroline Moorhead, who tells an extraordinary story of resistance in a very remote part of France in her book, uh, Village of Secrets. Marion Coutts, uh, whose book is about her husband's terminal illness. Uh, her book is The Iceberg. And then finally, Helen MacDonald, her book, H's for Hawk, uh, also about grief in a way, um, but also about the experience of, of training a goshawk. Roy Jenkins' two years at the Home Office, actually less than two years, are a classic example of the right man in the right job at the right time. Half a century later, his brief tenure still excites admiration and controversy in equal measure. Coinciding with the height of Beatlemania, the miniskirt, the contraceptive pill, and swinging London, but also with the Rolling Stones, the drug scene, and the first Vietnam War demonstrations, the period 1965 to 67 now appears, for good or ill, a turning point in the social history of the country, a halcyon time of personal liberation or the onset of national decadence. Of course, Jenkins did not create, but only reflected, the new moral climate which 20 years of peace and growing affluence suddenly produced in the mid-60s. But he was far more in tune with the changing times than most Home Secretaries. He was openly on the side of the youth revolution, not against it. And if a 45-year-old balding politician could hardly be its patron saint, he was certainly its benevolent sponsor. In the debates about homosexuality in the 60s, and homes, no one ever admitted to knowing a homosexual. And yet, obviously, they all did. But it was all sort of, it was not talked about. But, but they all knew that there was, there, was a, there was something that a lot of perfectly decent people that they all knew were being treated as a criminal offence and, and had to be legalised. Um, I don't think he was more anxious to do it for his own personal reasons. He had no no personal interest in the abortion bill. He wasn't particularly interested in theatre censorship. I mean, he went, you know, but he could see that these were archaic laws that were making Britain in the 1960s ridiculous and Victorian and needed to be swept away. And he had this agenda of all these things that he wanted to do, which he'd been campaigning for since the 50s. And fortunately, he was Home Secretary at just the right time to be able to push that agenda through. And he did, as I say, an remarkable amount in a very short time. The death of a parent, obviously, is part, meant to be part of, part of a natural order of things, but um, it hit me very hard. We were very, very good friends, my father and I. He was just suddenly gone, and that, that was a real rent in the world. And uh, I coped with it in a very unusual way, one that I don't recommend, by the way. Uh, I don't recommend buying a goshawk as a way of coping with bereavement. So this is the, um, the moment we have to take the hawks out of the box to, to check that the ring numbers on their legs, they're all captive bred, matched with the paperwork. It's all a bureaucracy in, 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 in hawk breeding. Another hinge untied. Concentration, infinite caution, daylight irrigating the box, scratching talons, another thump, and another thump. The air turned syrupy, slow, flecked with dust, the last few seconds before a battle, and with the last bow pulled free, he reached inside, and amidst a whirring, chaotic clatter of wings and feet and talons and a high-pitched twittering, and it's all happening at once. The man pulls an enormous, enormous hawk out of the box, and in a strange coincidence of world and deed, a great flood of sunlight drenches us, and everything is brilliance and fury. The hawk's wings barred and beating, the sharp fingers of her dark-tipped primaries cutting the air, her feathers raised like the scattered quills of a fretful porpentine. Two enormous eyes. My heart jumps sideways. 
She's a conjuring trick, a reptile, a fallen angel, a griffin from the pages of an illuminated bestiary, something bright and distant like gold falling through water, a broken marionette of wings, legs, and feathers. She's wearing jesses and the man holds them. For one awful long moment, she's hanging head downward, wings open like a turkey in a butcher's shop, only her head is turned right way up, and she's seeing more than she has ever seen before in her whole short life. Her world was an aviary no larger than a living room. Then it was a box. But now it is this, and she can see everything. The point source glitter on the waves, a diving cormorant a hundred yards out, pigment flakes under wax on the lines of parked cars, far hills and the heather on them, and miles and miles of sky where the sun spreads on dust and water, and illegible things moving in it that are white scraps of gulls. Everything is startling and new stamped on her entirely astonished brain. You're right, it was as ruinous in a way as if I'd taken a needle and shot myself with heroin about this, yes. taking on this task. Yes. Well, and it becomes a kind of addiction and a kind of plight for you as well. It does. It? I mean, it was a way of, I say in the book that the hawk was everything I wanted to be. I was, I was you know, it, it was free from grief. It was completely numb to the hurts of human life. It lived in its eternal present. And also it was very ferocious. And what was, uh, became my obsession, became my addiction, was to go out with the hawk once she was flying free and follow her as she hunted like a wild hawk. And the landscape was, Something happened to the way I saw the world. You know, I, I stopped being grief-stricken. I stopped being me. I, I saw the world as this incredibly detailed, patterned place of kind of, um, and the lines of sort of desire and force that 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 drew me across the landscape were ones that I saw in the hawk. So I, I sort of became a half-human, half-hawk kind of individual. It was a, it was a radical unanchoring from the world, and it made me quite depressed towards the end. I I, I really had neglected all the things in my life that that kept me kept me sane, really. Um, your book is very conspicuously in dialogue with another book. I mean, yes. you're uh, having a conversation, I think you describe it as, with um, T.H. White's book. Um, that had always been an important book for you, had it? It had, and it, it infuriated me as a child. I read this book by this chap who didn't know how to train a hawk, which was T.H. White. Um, and I, I didn't understand why any grown-up would write a book about something he didn't know, he didn't know how to do. Um, and I watched this terrible episodes of him trying to train this goshawk while not really knowing what he was doing and sort of torturing it. It was an incredibly tragic book. Um, and much later I realised that the hawk was really a way of him fighting the things in himself that he, he found difficult to master or, or constantly suppressed. Sort of, he saw the hawk as being very... Releasing by proxy. Exactly, as a kind of incredible kind of negotiation. So he, the hawk was sort of a sadistic fey presence for him, so he was fighting those things in himself. But I mean, the, whole, the, the book in, at heart, I think, is something about it is, is about the attempt to put yourself in other minds. And one of those minds is the inhuman mind of the hawk and the lure of doing that. And the other one is in a slightly more, in a much more difficult and conflicting kind of way. I tried to put myself in the mind of T.H. White, a man who I have enormous problems with. You know, he was a very difficult character. But that became a fascinating um, thing to try and do. Mm -hmm.